Professor, I can't hear you, but can you hear me? Just mute me. Oh, so on the 18th, you will get an email from ATI telling you to do the orientation module. You'll probably have something due your first assessment on the 21st, and then the final assessment is due the Sunday. So it's due Sunday. You have seven weeks. You can get up to, if you wanted to, a full 230 points. But like I said, you don't have to at Laboray. You only have to go up to 180 points. The Picmonics extra credit. I showed you guys during the orientation how to get in that. You don't have to do anything for that other than watch the playlists that we put up. Make sure you do up to 200 questions. As long as you're using your Laboray email, then we can see that you've done it. And again, Anisia would be the person to contact the librarian if there's an issue. 200 questions per each Picmonics. So 200 for the first one, and then 200 for the second one. You mean per playlist, right? Well, per exam. So you have exam one, you're going to do 200 questions, 30 videos, and that gives you one extra credit point. And then for exam three, you have 200, another 200 questions and uh, 30 videos, which will give you another extra credit point prior to exam three. Yeah, so as Caitlin says, it's 200 per exam content. Okay, but you guys put together a playlist? Yes, so pretty much every, um, available playlist that goes with uh, the Pearson book, we have a playlist in there. So you guys will be able to watch well over 30 videos. So again, highlighting. So you need to log into your, so here you have your mid-semester math test, math assessment, which is at three. And after that, we have our healthcare disaster and emergency preparedness. Again, remember that exam three starts at 3 p.m. Then you have a live lecture. On the 22nd, you have your ATI comprehensive B exam. And then you will have a live lecture with Professor Parker. And then just to highlight this week, where you have the medication progression exam at 315. And also we'll do our final review that day. And then you have this week here, which is mandated and mandatory um, from 4 p.m. to 9 p.m., your ATI review. All right, and so at this point, once you have your comprehensive final, you will know where you stand pretty much with your grade. And if you reach that 77, you'll go on and do your final uh, predictor. So the looks like the only new content that will be on the exam will be concepts 28B and 23C, bipolar disease and schizophrenia. Everything else will be covered in another exam. 
And so as Lindsay says, we have playlists posted in the majority of our um, exemplars. And so for this class, it's posted under professionalism, commitment, um, and development to practice. And that's where you'll find that playlist. You'll copy that playlist to your uh, clipboard, and then you will watch the videos, and then you can tailor your exam. You can do 80 questions from that. You can do 50 questions from that. It, it's your choice. So any questions about the syllabus, about the IG? All right, so I'm going to start our lecture here. So with some of the exams, um, it may be that they needed to be scheduled early due to possibly other exams that are being given. Um, I'm not sure why some of them are at three. Uh, it's just important that we let you guys know so that you can make the changes or uh, change your schedule. So April, if you go to Monday's recording, you'll see that each week you get 10 points per each piece of um, the capstone. You can get up to 30 points every week. So every week you have the opportunity to get 30 points for um, your capstone. So if you go into commitment to the profession, there will be a um, playlist posted for Picmonix. All right, so these are some fun topics that we're going to be talking about today and yet they can be a little tricky because they're not the tangible type of things it's not like a pulse or a blood pressure where you can feel it and so we're going to be talking about ethics and commitment to the profession and professionalism just going to make sure I'm on a timer here so I can finish one on time and make sure we have enough time to do the other one. All right, so. Let's get into this. So the 30 points are based on remediation and assessments, little assessments that you do with your coach from ATI every week. As your educators, we don't do anything with capstone other than if you feel like you're not getting good remediation or you're not receiving the remediation on time, to let us know if there's any issues with your coach. But otherwise it's between you and the ATI coach. They will be sending you um, a pre-assessment quiz, then they'll send you a remediation, and then they'll send you a post-assessment to see how you did after the remediation. And each of those is worth 10 points. All right. so. The definition of professionalism, and this is the definition within both of the lectures that we're talking about today, is basically the delivery of standard-based nursing care that is consistent with moral, altruistic, legal, ethical, regulatory, and humanistic principles. 
And this is a definition that's adapted from the Nurse of the Future Core Competencies of 2016. Those core competencies are competencies that were put together by the Massachusetts Board of Registration of Nursing, just to make sure that all nurses in pre-licensure education were receiving the same information, regardless of what program you're in. And so if you look here at the scope of what we're gonna be talking about, so this Venn diagram here talks about where the intersectionality of your professional identity, which is you know, influenced by your institutional role, excuse me, and what position you take. Also, that formation involves any of the roles, competencies, and identities. So you will walk in, you know, with a little bit of nursing culture because you've been in nursing school. You'll be socialized to your institution and to the culture and roles. There'll be certain behavioral competencies that will be expected of you. And then you will have some emergent identities based on the culture of your unit and as you adapt to the healthcare culture, because we are our own culture, we have our own language, you will then kind of sort of have your own pretty much personality within the healthcare system. And all of these intersect and influence one another. All right, so these are some values that are vital to nursing practice. All right, so starting with altruism. What is the definition of altruism or what do you guys see it as? So it's caring about the well being of someone. So concern of welfare and well being. And may include being truthful, but there are some other um, values that also talk about uh, truthfulness. So having empathy for the patient. Do, um, what about autonomy? So autonomy is basically the ability of the patient to make their own choice and respect in that choice. And making sure we educate the patient if they refuse something or if they're asking for something that may seem like it's impossible, we need to educate them on you know, what they're refusing and what they're asking for. What about human dignity? So being worth of respect. So basically all of us are worthy of respect. It doesn't matter what our background is, what our socioeconomic status is. You know, Florence Nightingale historically said that nursing is for the poor. You know, nursing is for everyone. We don't discriminate based on anything. What about integrity? So being honest, taking ownership, doing what's right, having respect for honesty, truthfulness, keeping to your word. And we'll talk that will also fit into another um, value that we'll talk about a little bit. What about social justice? So 
So again, fairness, equality with everyone, advocating the same for every single patient, not discrimination, providing equal care. And, you know, justice also falls under, and I think this is highlighted in your Pearson book, even in the time that you decide to spend with your patients. So how do you decide, you know, how much time you spend with patient A versus how much time you spend with patient B? That can fall under justice and how we divide up our time. And for the most part, you typically are dividing your time based on priorities of care and not because, oh, this person is a donor to the hospital and so we have to treat them really well. So it's all about making sure that we're focused on our values in nursing and not focused on inequality or discriminating and providing equal care for all. What about non-maleficence? So do no harm. The goal is to do no harm. And beneficence? So do good. And do what benefits the patient the most. Non-maleficence and beneficence sometimes can be a little confusing to pick out a part because they're sort of almost kind of saying the same thing. We want to promote and do good and we don't want to cause harm, which is also the attempt to do good. And so typically, you know, within a, a class like this, we're not going to ask you a question where both of those are choices for answer just because a lot of people get them confused. And sometimes people use them interchangeably. What about fidelity? So following through on promise, keeping your promises, telling the truth. I know all of you guys have done pieces or done clinical or some of you guys may work in a hospital. What is the biggest breaker of fidelity that you've noticed? So veracity is keeping our promises. What's one thing every nurse says as they leave a patient's room that they don't always adhere to? Ah, the I'll be back. I'll be right back. I'll be back in a minute. Or yes, you promise the patient ice chips and you leave and you forget to bring the ice chips and then the patients call in a few minutes later. And so that can erode the trust between you and a patient. And so you always wanna make sure when you make a promise that you go fulfill that promise. And saying I'll be right back means nothing because I'll be right back could be 15 minutes or it could be two hours. And so you wanna be honest with your patients. Some patients are like, you have what? Four of the patients? No. And so it's about saying, you know, sir, I'm going to go see my other patients right now. You know, you're all set. Is there anything I can do for you before I leave? And, you know, I should be back or I can be back in about two hours. But if you need something before then, you can go ahead and put your light on. And we also have a nurse's aide on the unit who will be coming in to help you, you know, get your uh, stuff together to take your morning back. But, you know, if you say, I'll be back as soon as I can, what does that mean to the patient? They're like, is that two hours? Is that three hours? You said you had four patients. So are you spending an hour with each patient? So just giving yourself a lot of latitude, like I'll be back in two hours. If you go back before the two hours, awesome. If you can't make it back in the two hours because something happens, a patient codes, just wanna either send the nurse's aide or send someone down to the room to let the patient know 
there's an emergent situation going on, or you know, you after everything settles down, you explain to the patient, I apologize, there was an emergent situation that happened and I couldn't get back. What about veracity? And so that is to tell the truth and to be honest. So the one thing that I can suggest is know these definitions, know them as best as you can so that you can apply them to scenarios. And so this is the nurse and code of ethics. I know you guys have read it. Just I'm gonna point out some of the bolded areas is that the ethical tradition of nursing is self-reflective, enduring, and distinctive. And it informs every aspect of the nurse's life. And so um, it not only informs our practice at the bedside, but it also should be informing how we live our life. And this is all from the Code of Ethics with interpretive statements. So when we have ethical issues in nursing, and when we have a conflict, we have to kind of think about it. And so this quote here by Cindy Rushton is, you know, kind of a good quote that you guys have reviewed. And so I'm just going to talk about the different ethical issues. And so in ethical uncertainty, you're not really sure whether the situation is an ethical issue. You may need to consult your charge nurse or your consult a physician on the team to suss out, you know, is there an ethical issue going on here? You know, I'm not 100% sure. Ethical distress is you sort of have identified that there's an ethical issue. It's causing you some distress from within. And so then you need to figure out how you're going to address it. It may be distressful just to you because of your own morals and values or it may be something that the team or what uh, the people, the medical doctors are not aware of. And so once you bring it up, you know, everyone will feel a little like, oh, okay, we have to fix that. And so, you know, just a simple example I can think of is a patient who maybe has no family, they don't look like they're going on the right track and we're gonna probably have to get them a legal guardian to you, you may already know that and feel distressed about it because it's not an easy process. And that's something you can bring to the team and be like, you know, I've looked high, I've looked low, the social work has looked, we can't find any family. He doesn't look like he's going to be doing well. We need a legal guardian because in order to you know, change the patient from full code to DNR, we're gonna need a guardian. And so that might be something where you can kind of, maybe you're feeling distressed because you're like, oh my God, if this patient codes, we're going to have to intubate and it's probably not going to be best for the patient situation. And then you have an ethical dilemma where two things come into conflict with one another, whether it's between the nurse and the patient, the nurse and the healthcare provider, or the providers and the patient. And there is a decision that needs to be made. And it's always wise to get your ethics committee in when you have an ethical dilemma. This is what they're there for. This is what they deal with and to try to resolve the issue as best we can using the moral or any other method of um, going through an ethical dilemma. And then you have ethical residue, which is, you know, once an issue appears to have been resolved, what are you left with inside? 
And sometimes what you're left with is not how you wanted the situation to go. And so, you know, little things like that can start to create moral distress. And so you always want to talk to someone, you know, or debrief any situation where you had some ethical issues an ethical dilemma and maybe you weren't completely satisfied with how things turned out you want to reach out to a social worker that's there for the employees and go have a private um, conversation sometimes just airing it out to a confidential person is enough where you can kind of get it off your chest. All right, so now we come to our ethical decision making, which is we're using the moral model for ethical decision making. And what we're gonna do, and so I did read a lot of your responses to the Charlie Guard situation. And it was just surprising how people look at it from different perspectives. And that really is like the thing about an ethical dilemma. We're not all gonna look at it from the same point of view. People who have kids may think of their kids and look at it differently versus people that don't have kids, people that really believe that quality of life is someone who's got brain function may say, well, you know, this person's never gonna regain brain function. I agree with what happened. And so let's talk about the Charlie Guard dilemma. So what data in this situation identified that there was a dilemma? What were the competing interests? Um, the the parent won the. Oh shit! You can go ahead and speak. And so basically, it was a struggle between the parents and the medical team and the courts because there was a physician in the US who had offered this NBT treatment. Yeah, so essentially as Diana puts it, it comes down to the parents' wishes versus the healthcare wishes. And so, you know, to think, that's our dilemma, parental wishes versus physician or healthcare team wishes. So then we have to clarify our options available and the consequence each option has um, or the potential of each action. And this step is used to better understand the options rather than making a final decision. So what were our options in this case? What were the things that we could do? So we could provide sort of palliative care, comfort measures, We could keep the patient on life support versus trying that NBT medication. So it was either treatment, comfort measures, and letting the patient die with dignity. You know, as providers, it's important that we should be able to look at the parents' wishes and see both sides of things and not act out of despair, really think about treating him to die with dignity. So now we have our 
three options, which is do the research treatment, provide palliative care and comfort, withdraw him from support while letting him pass peacefully, letting sort of nature take its process, as might be said. And then we get to the R. So now we're gonna review the criteria and we're going to try to resolve so we can make a choice. So we wanna determine the best worst case scenario of choosing each particular alternative and evaluate it from various perspectives. And in this case, what were the ethical dilemmas that were presented within this case? So justice, yep, non-maleficence versus beneficence. And what was the, uh, great, autonomy was the other huge one. And so euthanasia is a specific situation that can create an ethical dilemma. It's not a, a ethical principle. And so what if you were asked to participate in euthanasia, you would use this moral outline to look at it. And once you got to A, you would realize that the American Association of Nurses Code for Ethics does not support euthanasia. And then that could be the basis of whether you decide to make your decision or you could just go another route. So we figured out that the ish, the ethical principles here, justice, autonomy, beneficence, and non-maleficence. So, and we're gonna look at it from different points of view. So Arthur, are you asking about why euthanasia is against the code of ethics? Um, so both the American Medical Association and the Nursing Association do not agree in actively um, euthanizing someone or giving them medication with the sole purpose to cease life. When we look at palliative care and comfort measures, the reason we give a patient morphine is to keep them comfortable and to keep their breathing from being uncomfortable. There are some states that allow it. Mass is not one of them. So we did vote and it was like a failure. I think like 20% of people voted for it. I mean, we. A lot of you may have heard of Dr. Kevorkian. If you haven't, it's a great case to look into. Um, you know, it's funny, yes, our preamble does talk about the right to die with dignity. However, the AMA and ANA do not endorse um, euthanasia. For them, it does not line up with their code of ethics such as do no harm, you know, to them, they see it as we are prematurely ending someone's life. Not to say that when I put a patient on comfort measures and give them more being that I'm not hastening the end of their life, I, I am, but the intention is to make the patient comfortable. I'm not giving them you know, the most amount of morphine I can to make them stop breathing. I'm giving them just enough morphine so they're not gasping for air and that they're comfortable in the dying process. Yep, a lot of people have that belief, um, which is why the um, questions probably were asked on a ballot. So whether you live in a state where it's legal 
or illegal. You just have to choose for yourself and look at your own morals and values, whether that's something you would choose to participate in. Um, we all have the choice of where we're gonna work. And one of the first things you should always do is look at the unit you're gonna work on, review your job description and understand what's expected from you, ask questions about the type of patient population that is admitted to this unit, to this hospital, what, do, what are their philosophies, what's their missions, what are their values, so that you don't get stuck working somewhere that does not coincide with your own values and beliefs. So now that we've kind of looked at the different um, ethical principles that are, we're gonna be looking at, we wanna affirm our position and act. So based on the review, we determine which of the options is best to do. And for a nurse, you can use the ANA code of ethics to support your conclusions. And so if you were asked to euthanize a patient, you could say, you know, per the ANA code of ethics, it does not support that nurses should participate in euthanization. And it's probably also illegal in the state or whether it's legal or not. And you can just say, I choose not to participate. And so in this particular situation, what were the, we talked about the three options that could have been tried. They could have given the patient the medication, could have done palliative care, could have removed the patient from support and let them pass peacefully. And so it's, you know, those are the three options. And the doctor or the, in this case, they chose to go with keeping the patient comfortable. And from their perspective, the patient was brain dead. And I'm not sure about the UK or England, but in the United States, if you are legally brain dead, you are legally dead. And so you, uh, you know, doctors look at you as if you're dead. And that is typically the time of death that they will record is when they find that you are at that point um, brain dead. So this, so um, April has a question here. So if it's legal, but you choose not to participate, can you lose your license? No, you cannot lose your license. Um, if you don't want to participate in something that's against your values and you feel it's going to cause you more moral distress, you don't participate. Best thing is if you know that that's what's going to happen with the patient that day is you ask for an assignment change because that's not a situation you want to put yourself in. And there might be other nurses that have no qualms about taking care of the or doing that and they could, you know, step in and take care of the patient. And so to lose your license, you really have to practice outside your scope and be pretty negligent um, and careless. So in this situation, what did the doctors decide to do? So they decided that the patient was brain dead and they wanted to withdraw life support and the family did not want to do that. And so they took it to the courts and the courts supported the doctors. And so this was a big 
issue in the news. And one of the reasons why the doctor, the courts agreed with the physicians was that the NBT treatment that was being um, offered had never been tried on a human. I don't know what phase of clinical trials it was on, but it had never been tried on a human, was not sure that it would work. Um, this patient was beyond, you know, they weren't alive anymore, they were brain dead. And they posited as well that the doctor from the US did not look at any of the scans, did not look at any of the, um, like his medical records to even know whether he would be a good candidate for this or not. Yes, exactly, Caitlin. The doctor had not done enough research to say he could help. He was sort of speculating and it almost like offering false hope. Like you haven't looked at the chart and you haven't, you know, really looked at what's going on. Ah, financially invested. So personally, and you know, when there are decisions made, you always got to go back. It's like the nursing process. So you make the decision and then you evaluate the success of your intervention. What were your personal and professional values that were considered? What ethical principles were applied? How did the process turn out for all involved? And if it had to be done over again, are there things that you would have done differently? And so if we uh, know that typically doesn't hurt the physician's license, you know, offering false hope because it, a lot of times the hope they're, you know, what they're offering may be grounded in some science, but we know that it really isn't going to move this patient forward. So if we look at the Charlie Gard case, how do we think it turned out for all involved? So I, yeah, it, to me, I don't think it uh, went well for either party. You know, the doctors didn't want to go to court. We never wanted to take a patient and family to court. They were already in a stressful situation with a child who was born with a genetic condition and which they didn't really know much about. And, you know, by the time they got him to the hospital, it was already really late. And um, then to take them to court definitely caused a lot more distress. And it was better, I think, all around to take them off um, child support. I'm uh, child, I keep saying child support, take them off life support. But however, they, um, it was just a bad situation for. I think all involved. And I do not know if they test for MDDS. I'm not sure. And so I know Andrea had shared that she had had a similar situation as a parent. I don't know, Andrea, if you were willing to share further on your perspective. You can unmute yourself if you wanna speak. I don't know if you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. 
it's just there's a lot of noise in the background. Um, so yeah, I had a 24 week preemie and we had a lot of decisions to make. Um, you know, with a baby that size, she was only a pound and, you know, they, they have so many um, medical problems that come with that. And, um, you know, even just from before I had her, like when I was in, you know, labor, they would come to me and ask me like, we have a, enough, like we have this problem. Do you want to even try? Like when she, when she's born, do you want us to just let her go, or do you want to try? And they came to me like weeks ahead of time with that question because they wanted to give me enough time to really think about it and make that decision because it was a big ethical decision. And I mean, and she was my first, and I know that I made the choice to try because you know I had just fallen in love with her and she was my child and everything. So. Like I get, I get the parents just torture. It's a torturous thing to have to go through to see your child suffer and not be able to do anything about it. So you want to just throw everything at it that you can, you know what I mean? And like you, and you see them, you know, suffering, but um, I have to say I threw everything at it that we could and yeah. she is bad. Like she had neck too, she perforated, she had everything. She had, she was intubated for 13 weeks. She, she, um, she had a PDA, so she had no blood pressure at all. She was being kept alive by every machine they had and every drug they had for months. And, and she was like over 50% acrotic and, and you could see it too, the black tissue and everything just, she was awesome. mm-hmm. but I'm, um, <laughs> but she's 17 years old today. Wow. Look at that. Oh, you know what? It, yeah, I know. You never know. Like they're so strong and yep. She, it was just amazing. And the doctors were always crying. They're like, I don't know. She was <laughs> just amazing. And yeah, she is the most amazing person. And she has two little sisters now. They were totally fine and everything. But, you know, I just wanted to share that because you just, it's just such a hard, it is hard. And like, I know it's easy to be like, oh my God, the kid's suffering. Why, why do that? <laughs> but like, my, my view was a little different because I had this experience before, but, and also, like being on both ends of the spectrum, you know, you, you see a child suffer, but also too, if they're not really neurologically in there, they're not really experiencing that anyway. You know what I mean? It's not like she remembers any of that or, or anything. Yeah. So it's it it was um I don't know, there's just so many facets to to consider and 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 never easy for anyone in any position to make so you know there's that no thank you so much for sharing and what a wonderful story thank you and that is you know sometimes not sometimes but a lot of times we bring our personal values into the situation you know we have had these experiences and, and we kind of can look at it from both the medical and the personal perspective. And sometimes if you don't have those experiences, it, you may, it may be hard to look at the other side. And so I remember I had a 21-year-old patient who had a VTAC arrest. No one did CPR for 20 minutes. This was out in New Hampshire. He was playing football, I think. And um, 20 minutes before the ambulance got to him. So, you know, within 20 minutes, your brain is not getting oxygen. It's a serious issue. So he comes in basically in, you know, pretty much VTAC the whole time, getting shocked, getting all the medications. And finally, he gets stabilized. They do uh, uh, MRI and see that he has anoxic brain injury. However, his brain stem still works. So he can breathe and he can control his heart rate. And that was pretty much all he could do. And At the time, I didn't have any kids. I was pretty much brand new into the ICU. And the mother was like, well, we're going to trach, we're going to peg him, and we're going to take him home. And that's what they did. And I just found it at the time to be odd. Like, why would they make a decision like that? You know, his friends would come in. They would post all these pictures of him. He seemed like a very vivacious, outgoing uh, young man. And I'm like, he's not going to be the same. He's not who he was. He'll never speak. He'll never do anything. But I think as a parent, 
it's just a different way that you're looking at things. And especially where he wasn't completely brain dead, it was hard to tell them definitively, like, you know, we couldn't say like, you know, a miracle won't happen. And in five years, he'll get some brain function back. We really couldn't predict that the brain is so complex. But sometimes when you are a parent and you see these issues, it, it impacts you a little differently. So does anyone have any other input on the Charlie Guard case? I think overall, everyone did a great job with APA uh, format. Um, the papers gave your um, opinions and also you guys took some data from the videos. And so if anyone is planning to move on to get their BSN or to get their MSN, you wanna brush up on your APA. There's a free website called the OWL Purdue, P-E-R-D-U-E, -E, where they have examples of different ways of referencing, different, you know, how do you reference a newspaper versus a book versus an article? Or you can purchase a pro program called P-E-R-R-L-A and you put it right into your Word and you it formats your paper for you. It does the running head, the cover, the page numbers, all the margins are the right way, the right um, font. And it's super useful if you plan on continuing on because uh, the BSN program does have a lot of writing in it. That's just a little side note. I love the Perla and it's forever. Like I bought mine in 2007 and I still can use it. I was like, for me at the time, it was the best $30 I'd ever paid. And so ethical dilemmas exist when two or more rights values, obligations, or responsibilities come into conflicts. And conflicts may arise um, because of the nurse's personal value and those of another individual or the organization, the nurse's principles and the need to achieve a desired outcome, two or more individuals or groups to whom the nurse has an obligation, so as nurses, we're obligated to the patient. We're sort of also obligated to the medical team and in following orders from the healthcare providers. Sometimes those come into conflict. And so we have to sort of decide how we're gonna get through the situation. And so factors that sort of elevate ethical dilemmas are technological changes. And so every day there are newer and newer technologies that are um, coming into play and making people live longer and providing services and things that we didn't have options to five years ago. And so people, you know, the thing I say is just because the technology is available, it doesn't mean that we need to offer it to this patient if we don't think it's going to be something that's going to alter their life. Uh, there are social, social changes uh, in the community that can affect uh, ethical dilemmas, conflict in loyalties and obligations, and then there are ethical dilemmas in patient care. So HIV AIDS, this is not so much a huge issue in this generation, but when I started nursing, we were wearing gowns and gloves and using face shields if we thought we were gonna get splashed because of a patient with HIV AIDS. And I always thought it was weird because I'm like, half of these patients, we don't even know if they have it. Why don't we just treat everyone the same? At some point, 
within the first two to three years of my nursing career, and this was in 2001, they kind of agreed. So someone must have done research and realized that all patients' bodily fluids should be treated as contaminated and we should always protect ourselves. And so that's where the term universal or standard precautions came from. Other dilemmas include genetic testing. And so one that, you know, I always find kind of heartbreaking is Huntington's chorea, which is a neurological disease that leaves the patient essentially unable to talk and with so much muscle spasticity that we typically put them in one of those beds that are zipped so they don't throw themselves out of bed. They have such severe um, muscle um, spasms. And that is a disease that's passed down genetically and you can go get tested for it. Say, you know, a parent has it or a grandparent has it. You can go get tested and find out. Is that good or is that bad? You know, like it's up to uh, the person, I guess, to decide. And then we have issues of organ transplantation and end of life issues. And so organ transplantation, one thing to remember is that the doctors that are taking care of you, if you've had an accident or if you're in the hospital, they rarely know if you are an organ donor because I know I have it on my license and everyone's like, oh, when you go in, they're not going to take care of you as well. They're going to let you die so they can take your organs. And I'm like, well, how are they going to even know that I'm an, an organ donor? Um, someone's going to, you know, the doctors that are taking care of you when you come in from a trauma or if you're in the hospital for some situation, their job is to treat you and get you in the best optimal situation. They have no loyalty and no connection to the organ bank, which is why when we get to the end where we think that someone is not going to make it or should be pulled off life support, the doctor then calls the organ transplant team or organ bank and tells them like, hey, we have this patient, They're, we're pulling them off support. Do you wanna come in and see if the family's interested in organ transplantation? So it's a completely different set of doctors and nurses who come in and talk to the patients and family about organ transplantation. And they're the ones that also go and do the harvesting of the organs. It's not the medical team that was taking care of the patient. Because as you can see, it would be very conflicting because a physician may feel morally obligated that we don't have enough organs going around and may think like, oh, well, maybe we shouldn't, you know, this person is not going to do well. Maybe we should ask about organ donation. But choose totally separate teams two totally separate thoughts of how they approach healthcare. And end of life is always a sticky wicket because you have sometimes the family is ready to let the patient go, but the doctors are not, or vice versa, which is what happens typically is the family is not ready, but the doctors are like, uh, we don't have much more to offer this patient. And so, it's kind of always an issue where we have to figure out how we're gonna bring everyone to the table. And ethical issues in nursing practice. So a healthy work environment is super important, not only for you personally and your health, but also for the patient safety. Working with patients and families can sometimes create um, ethical issues especially if you have difficult patients or difficult families who don't understand how we work. And when it comes to nursing school, there's issues with academic dishonesty. And so 
for me, I just tell my students, you know, if you choose to participate in academic dishonesty by sharing a question on a test or asking someone to share it with you, then, you know, you're the one that's not learning anything. You're the one that will be, you know, paying for it because say it's an, uh, something that's huge on the NCLEX, you, you don't know it. And it's funny because my son and his friends were taking chemistry this semester and they decided that for homework, they each were gonna do a question and then share the answers with each other. And, you know, that worked out well for like five minutes because then it gets to the test and, you know, the person who answered one doesn't know how to get to answer 10 because they didn't go all the way through. And the people in the middle didn't know how they got there. And I'm like, so how did that work out for you? You took a test and you didn't know half of what was on it. And he's like, oh, I know, you know, we thought it would be easier to break down the work. And I'm like, that wasn't, you know, that you could do that, but at the end of the day, you guys all need to sit down and go through each problem and sort of teach each other how you guys got there. There's nothing wrong with group work, but I'm like, you know, first of all, if it's not supposed to be group work, don't do it as group work. But second of all, each step builds on the next one and you just missed three building blocks. Any questions about ethical dilemmas? So lifespan considerations, what you want to pay close attention to are infants and children who cannot make their own decisions and issues can arise when children do not agree with their parents or with their parents or guardians. And typically you'll have to call an ethics committee or the Department of Child Services adolescence, issues of consent and confidentiality. And so there are certain things you can tell the parents and certain things you can't tell the parents. And you know, this is something I learned um, when I was uh, working at a hospital where they had pediatrics was once a adolescent or a teenager has a baby, they're automatically emancipated from their parents and um, can make their own decisions as if they were an adult. Who knows, maybe if Charlie was older, things might have gone differently. So pregnant women, there's always that delicate balance of maternal rights versus fetal rights. And then we, yes, the parents do pay for the health insurance, but, um, the physicians don't have to disclose everything with you. Yes, Cassandra. Um, when you were just talking about the pregnant woman uh, having the rights, I remember we talked about this, I think last semester or something. If a woman who's let's say 15 has a baby, uh, she can make the decision for the baby. But if she had to make a decision for herself, her parents had to make the choices, correct? Correct. It's until she has that baby. Oh, okay. Then she becomes Thank emancipated. You. Oh, okay. Which, Thank you. Yeah. Which I was like, that's interesting. Uh, so older adults, the things that we need to um, be aware of is their uh, end of life issues, making sure we help them maintain their autonomy always assessing for competency and decision making. You know, just because someone is 80, we don't want to assume that they're not competent and able to make decisions. And so you guys watched all these videos and we've already talked about the ethical dilemmas that came up. Does anyone have any questions about the ethical dilemmas that came up? So when you are thinking of the ethics of research and experimental treatment, from a nursing perspective, you wanna make sure that your patient is protected and not being taken advantage of in a research study. 
And so one of the ways to do that is to look at the IRB, the Institute Research Board approval that they have received from the institution. And you want to look at you know, who signed the consent. And you may even ask the patient, you know, like, do you understand that you're in a study? Uh, do you have any questions? You know, you may not be able to answer the questions, but the people that we really look out for are children, pregnant women, elderly, people and adolescents. Those are the ones that we wanna protect um, because they can be easily duped into getting into a study and possibly being taken advantage of. And so the key points for this lecture, so you wanna know your ethical values. You wanna be able to define and apply them. So there'll probably be a little mix of both a situational and definition. I would say probably more situational, but if you know your definitions by heart, you'll be able to pick out what the dilemma is. Understand your life span considerations, that page that we talked about. Uh, from infants and children all the way to older adults, and look at the factors that influence ethical dilemmas. Now, this semester, what we want to do is also keep you guys aware of what the NCLEX will test on the particular topic. And so this is right from the NCLEX blueprint, and this is what they test on is recognize an ethical dilemmas and take an appropriate action, inform the client or staff members of ethical issues affecting client care, and practice in, in a manner consistent with the code of ethics for nurses, and evaluate an outcomes to promote ethical practice. And so that's the overall arc of what the NCLEX will test on. They don't test a lot on ethics, you know, I don't think we're gonna test a lot or really big on ethics either, but um, it is something that as a practicing nurse, you should be aware of. I'm just gonna pull up our, some case studies for us to do here so we can apply our knowledge. I always forget to stop sharing the other one before I share the new one. All right, so these are just some cases to help us sort of apply the material that we've learned. All right, so. A nurse is caring for a patient who is combative, agitated, and upset. The healthcare provider orders Haldol, five milligrams PO. The patient refuses the pill and continues to be agitated. The nurse knows, can, you guys can't see the PowerPoint? Okay. Um, the patient, the nurse knows that the patient enjoys drinking tea. The nurse dissolves the pill in the tea and gives it to the patient. In a few hours, the patient is calm and cooperative. Did this nurse violate any ethical pr principles? If so, which ones? So people are saying yes. So 
uh, violated the patient's autonomy and their right to refuse care. Yep, you guys are all on the right track. Veracity did not tell the truth, sort of hid the medication. Now, would it change anything for you if you were told that this patient is confused and the healthcare proxy has approved all medical treatment? Would then this nurse be violating anything? No. Because at this point, the healthcare proxy has agreed. We know the patient is confused and not within their right state of mind. And that's why you choose a healthcare proxy, someone that you trust that will make good decisions for you. So if someone, when someone is unable to make decisions for them, that is when we activate the healthcare proxy. So if someone becomes so confused Confused that they can't make decisions, um, we will uh, go to the healthcare proxy to make decisions. I'll upload these as a separate file so they can be accessed. I know they're uploaded in a weird way. All right. So now we have a nurse who's caring for a 14 year old patient who is combative, agitated and upset. The healthcare provider orders Haldol five milligrams PO. The patient refuses the pill and continues to be agitated. The nurse knows that the patient enjoys drinking tea. The nurse prepares the tea and asks the mother if it is okay to dissolve the medication in the tea and the mother agrees and gives it to the patient. In a few hours, the patient is calm and cooperative. Did this nurse violate any ethical principles? If so, which ones? And so why did this nurse not violate any ethical principles, but the other one did? So unless this 14-year-old is emancipated, it's the parent's call. The patient is a minor, the mother is involved, and the mother is considered, as Christina said, the mother is considered to be the person to give consent. And so in this situation, she did ask the mother if she could put the pill in the tea and the mother agreed. So we have a patient's family has asked the nurse and staff not to disclose the diagnosis to the patient. The patient asks you what their diagnosis is. What do you say? Do you tell the truth? If you don't tell the truth, do you violate any ethical principles and which ones? So we're all agreeing that we tell the truth. And so veracity, fidelity. And so really the big one here is veracity and telling the patient the diagnosis. The patient does have a right to know, but we all know there are certain cultures that believe that if you tell the patient integrity also, there are certain cultures that believe that if you tell the patient, what their diagnosis is, that they will lose their will to live and will actually hasten their death. And so do you feel like you should be, you should listen to the family? Could be a cultural consideration. Could educate the family. Yep, find out what their beliefs are. Definitely you have to take all points into consideration. I think personally what I would probably do is have the team along with the family have a meeting because as a nurse, if I go in to hang a bag of chemo, say the patient has cancer and the patient asks me why, what that medication is and what it's for, I 
have the duty to tell the patient the truth. I'm not going to say, oh, it's just antibiotics for this infection. No, I have to tell the truth. And so that's where it becomes very sticky. But then again, you may feel the wrath of the family if you tell and they don't know because I've experienced this as well. And then they'll blame you because you are causing their family member to die because now they've lost the will to live. So, you know, it's one of these things where you got to look at all of the players in the game, get them all together and, you know, talk about what's going on. You know, my cousin's grandmother, they didn't want to tell her that she had breast cancer because they, again, they thought it would like make her stop trying to live. But I remember being in the hospital. This was, I was a teenager with me and my cousin were just there hanging around and she started, you know, running her fingers through her hair and her hair is, is coming off. And she's like, I know I have cancer. She's like, I, I don't understand why no one will tell me, but she's like, I know I have cancer. She's like, I'm not going to ask anymore, but she's like, I know that's what it is. So it was kind of like the family just kind of felt like, do we confirm? Do we not confirm? And honestly, I can't remember if they did tell her the truth or not. But I think she went knowing the truth in her heart. So a patient is being discharged with no place to go from the emergency room in the winter. The healthcare proxy states to get the patient out as soon as possible. A nurse, as a nurse, you're concerned with this patient on the street, so you consult social work and find the patient a shelter for the night. Did this nurse violate any ethical principles or did she adhere to ethical principles or he? So the nurse didn't violate, she advocated, showed some altruism, And she also showed some empathy and justice and some beneficence to do good for the patient, some social justice here. Um, it's very sad when we have to discharge patients to the street. It's a terrible feeling and where we have no place for them to go. And so we try to do our best to buff them up, whether it's with clothing, warm clothing. And as Tara stated, they they come right back because they just can't, you know, if they have a true chronic illness, they can't manage it out in the street. And so instead of just listening to the doctor and throwing the patient out of the ER without support, we need to put some support in place. So maybe the patient can find a shelter or find some place where they can go get some assistance. All right, some NCLEX type questions here. So uh, the patient who is alert times three refuses their prophylactic DVT heparin sub Q injections. This is an example of the nurse adhering to which ethical principle? Justice, veracity, autonomy, or human dignity? So number three, autonomy. What do you do though when a patient refuses anything. Yes, I love it, Hannah. You respect their right to refuse, but you educate, explain, and document, and notify the physician. Most importantly is that we educate so they know what they're refusing and that you document this. If the heparin is ordered, three times on your shift, you will go into that room three times and say, Mr. So-and-so, I have your heparin or I'm going to get your heparin. Are you interested in getting that um, injection now? And the patient may say no again, but maybe you come back two days later 
and you say, Mr. So-and-so, I have your heparin injection. Are you interested in getting it today? And the patient may surprise you and say, yes. And then you can say, well, what changed your mind? And he can say, oh, I talked to a friend of mine whose wife died of a blood clot. And so I was really thinking about it. And, you know, now I want, you know, after hearing all the education and stuff, I really want to get it. So we never not educate. If it gets to the point where the patient is like, listen, stop offering me these, these injections. I don't want them. Then you would notify the physician and say, hey, this patient really doesn't want this medication. Can you come down, just do a final education with the patient? And then if he's really, he's not taking it, can we DC it from the med sheet? Because every time it shows up, I have to ask him and he's starting to get upset with me asking him. So we have a patient decides to leave the hospital AMA. The nurse understands that the patient has the autonomy to leave. What is the nurse's responsibility? And you can select all that apply. A or one, write a nurse a note that the patient left stable. Two, educate the patient regarding the risks of leaving. Three, tell the patient the insurance won't pay because they are leaving AMA. Or four, call security so that the patient cannot leave because they are sick. So I would probably do one and two. I may, the verbiage may be different. Is it true that insurance won't pay if they leave AMA? Or is that a scare tactic? Yes. So I remember when I was an, a nurse, we used to say this. It wasn't true, but we would say it to scare the patient and then also tell them they weren't getting their prescriptions if they left. And that really became a difficult issue because sometimes you have a patient who maybe is at the end of their treatment or you know they've been in the hospital for a few days Maybe they're a single mother and they don't have anyone to watch their kids and they need to leave the hospital to go take care of their kids. And so we should do whatever we can to support that patient who has to go home and um, take care of their duties. So give them the meds that they need. If they're on IV antibiotics, we'll convert them to PO and then maybe they should come to the clinic in a week instead of two weeks. So I guess if I was going to revise this question, I would just say write a nurse a note that the patient left in whatever condition they left. Typically, an unstable patient may not have the energy to actually leave. So when I think of stability, I think of hemodynamics. So if their blood pressure is low or their heart rates beat in too fast, or if they're super hypertensive and they may not have the energy to leave, but you could also look at a K of 3.0 as being unstable. And just, you know, when you write your note, state in that you notified the patient of the low electrolyte, you educated the patient on why they should stay to receive not only their other medical treatments, but also the replacement for the electrolyte. But the patient chose to leave, patient walked out, patient was wheeled out, did a family member come and get the patient? You know, as much detail as you can to know how the patient left the hospital. Yes, Maria. So this question doesn't specify if the patient left um, in a stable condition. So do we just go ahead and assume that the patient is stable? Um, no, I think I probably could have done a better job and probably just wrote that the patient left and took out the stable piece. Um, there's nothing to say that he's not stable, but we don't know that for sure. 
So I probably redo that question. Mm -hmm. All right, so a nurse has it keeps happening to me. A nurse has asked a second nurse to sign for a wasted narcotic, which was not witnessed, witnessed by another person. This seems to be a recent pattern of behavior. What is the appropriate initial action? One, just sign the narcotic sheet, but document the incident. Two, confront the nurse of suspected drug abuse or drug use. Three, report this immediately to the manager. Or four, counsel the colleague about risky behaviors. So three, you wanna to report to your nurse manager that you've noted some odd behavior and the person may not be using, they just may be lackadaisical in their nursing practice and that they're not getting a second person to witness. And so it's always important that when you're wasting narcotics that I see you pull out the one ML from the vial, you waste the 0.5 and then give whatever is in that 0.5 and then we sign it off as a waste. If there's no witness to a waste, it's kind of difficult to sign. I know nurses do this on the unit, but for NCLEX purposes, you don't sign unwitnessed wastes. You know, I know that people who have friends on a unit are like, hey, can you sign this for me? I threw this, I threw out a hundred of propofol. Do you mind signing? And they will do it. Yes, Maria. So before going straight to the uh, the nurse manager, isn't it better to first uh, talk to the, uh, the fellow worker? Then if they don't listen and the behavior continues, isn't that where I go ahead and notify the nurse manager? So you could go ahead and talk to the nurse of suspected drug abuse. More than likely, if even if they are abused and they're going to deny it, typically the best pattern and this is a pattern that you're noticing, typically the best thing is to have the nurse manager speak to them. And the nurse manager also has the authority to audit all their NARCs and see if what we think is a pattern truly is a pattern. And you know, as Tim and Josie are saying, you could escalate it into a conflict um, if you're confronting someone who is abusing meds because they may get suspended or they may get pushed out of the unit that's supplying their habit or feeding their habit. And so you come to work one day and then a nurse, you take, you know, you're talking to her. Yeah, for testing purposes, you always report suspicious activity. You're talking to the nurse and you smell alcohol on this nurse's breath. Again, if these were, you know, what would you do? You're gonna report it and you wanna report it to the nurse manager. Now this nurse who's got alcohol on their breath should be sent home. However, that is not a decision for you to make. You just take the information to your supervisor, whether it's a nurse manager or an off shift nurse manager, who can then look at the staff and sheet, look at who they can call in or figure out, okay, maybe we have three empty beds, so we'll just reassign these patients and get this nurse out of here and you know, figure out how to get this nurse some help. So the nurse returns to the client's room in exactly four hours to administer the next dose of pain medication as promised. Which of the following ethical rules is best demonstrated by this nurse? And I put the answer for you right here. 
fidelity. So the nurse said they were gonna come back in four hours and they came as promised. I know I put it up here. I was looking at it, but it wouldn't let me edit. So fidelity. So ethical dilemmas often arise over a conflict of opinion. Once the nurse has determined that the dilemma is ethical, a critical first step in negotiating the difference of opinion would be to A, gather all the relevant information, B, list the ethical principles that inform the dilemma, C, ensure that the attendant physician has written an order for an ethics consult, or D, consult a professional ethicist to ensure that the steps occur in full. And the answer is A. So you always wanna gather all the data first, just like in that moral where we massage, that is the, where we're gathering all the data, like what makes this a dilemma. And that's it. Any questions on ethics before we move on to professionalism? Yes. April has. So time. just just going back to case uh, the case study two that we just went over. I work on a PD psych unit, um, so it's interesting because the kids will refuse medications even though the parents are consenting for them. But we like for some reason we're encouraging them that at the end of the day it's a human right that they can refuse. So how would that fall into that like scenario? I am not sure. Uh, I know psych facilities operate under different rules than a regular hospital. So I would have to find out for you how that. Okay. Make sure I'm not sharing anything. So I'm gonna go through professionalism it might, I might go over a few minutes. So if you definitely need to leave at 6.30, feel free to leave. And this of course will be recorded. So you'll have access to it. Yeah, those case studies will be posted on e-learning. They're on e-learning now, but for some reason, the way they're posted, um, people are saying they're having difficulty getting to them. So this definition is the same definition that we reviewed from earlier. And so this professionalism activity is just something I want you guys to think about and think about what makes someone professional, think of a role model and what behaviors have led you to feel that that person was a professional and are individuals born with characteristics of professionalism or are they learned? And what are your thoughts? So personally, I think that, you know, we're not all born with, you know, professionalism. Some of us are raised in different environments where aspects of professional behavior are taught or ingrained in our behavior, but, I think anyone can learn uh, professional behavior. And some people are just born with a gentle nature and a very polite nature, but not, not everyone. So really, I want you to pay attention to this slide. I want you to know this information. So when I say this, put a star, make sure you know these definitions. So what does it mean as far as your commitment to the profession when you have affective um, commitment. So this is you feeling very attached to the profession, you're satisfied and you have a strong desire to maintain within the profession. Normative, you're feeling obligated to continue in the profession, past experiences, you've had with the profession has created the desire to join the profession. And so this could be someone who's worked as a nurse's aide or maybe as an LPN 
and really has enjoyed those um, types of work and now want to pursue and go on to become an RN. We have the continuous continuance commitment phase where someone maintains in the profession due to realizing negative consequences of leaving, such as loss of income. They're typically in it for the money and job security. These may be some of the nurses that you run into that are a little bit past their time in the field, but because of all these issues, they haven't left. And so in 2008, when you know the crisis, financial crisis happened, there were lots of nurses who were gearing up to retire, but their 401ks and 403bs were completely demolished. So they had to stay and work because the consequences, consequences of leaving would have left them, you know, pretty much broke. So they may not have been the happiest bunch of nurses because they didn't want to be nurses anymore. They wanted to retire. And so let's talk about the five stages of commitment to the profession. What happens in the exploratory phase? This is where you're excited, you're learning, maybe you're at a job and you see what the nurses are doing and you ask questions and you're gathering information, learning about the profession. You're thinking about it. You're like, hmm, I think I could go to nursing school. And then what about the testing phase? So now you get into the nursing school, you're trying it out, but you start to discover some negative aspects. You start to question whether you can do it or not. You know, you're like, oh, I'm gonna have to work holidays and weekends. I'm not sure about this. Did I get, can I do it? Did I pick the right profession? And the passionate stage, So now you're loving it and you're applying the things that you have learned. You are happy. You're like, okay, I made the right decision. You accept both the negatives and the positives and the positives probably outweigh the negatives. And then what happens in the quiet and bored stage? I'm just tired. You're comfortable with the role. Maybe you want to be done. Maybe you need a change. And this is always time to go back to the exploratory phase. Maybe try a different role, a different unit. You know, start looking for something else. You're comfortable. But, and uh, you may be burnt out. And what about the integrated phase? So this is where you're reflecting, eager to take the NCLEX if you're a student, ready to work. You just want to get out there. You just want to be a part of the profession. You've integrated that positive and negative. And so that will be you guys at the end of the semester. If we look at Benner's stages of nurse expertise, so I really liked how that CRNA student uh, talked about Benner and applied it to the student level because Benner can be applied to any stage of nursing, whether you're a nurse in school or whether you are a practicing nurse. And so the novice needs step-by-step -step instructions. And so that's, kind of where you're gonna start, where you need the policy, you need the procedure printout, you need to read and do each step as it says. So what it looks like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. The advanced beginner 
can start to use advice and context. So let's say you've learned that when you listen to the lungs, you listen anteriorly, and then you listen posteriorly. And so you're, you're doing this, you listen anteriorly, then you flip the patient over and listen posteriorly, but you're not looking at the skin. You're not assessing other things. And so a more experienced nurse may say, hey, when you turn that patient over, because sometimes it's a lot of work to turn a patient over, just, you know, don't just assess the lungs, but also assess the whole skin on their back, you know, palpate anything that you need to. And so you're open to maybe doing things slightly out of order, but still, you know, maintaining your, you know, what you know. And then the competent nurse has had experience with real problems, no longer struggles with basic rules, and can know a little bit about sort of bending rules just a little bit. And so when we talk about basic rules, so when you guys go to clinical next week or the week after, the week after, you know, you're gonna go in and you know, you have to remind yourself, like, I need to double check the wristband. When I scan the wristband, I need to make sure I ask for their name and date of birth. Versus the nurse who is competent has ingrained that in their practice. And when they walk into the room, that may be the first thing they say, you know, can you tell me your name and date of birth? Confirmed, move on. So typically, what research has shown is that it takes about two to three years to get to the competence stage. And then the proficient stage, you see the big picture, you can begin addressing problems for the organization and not just for your unit. And so you start to look at things like, oh, we're getting a lot of catheter Foley infections. Well, what can we do about that? You know, is this something that's just us or is this something that's hospital wide? And then the expert, no longer needs rules and works intuitively. And so they may come in and they're the nurse that will say, you know, I think that patient's not gonna have a good day today. I suspect that patient has a GI bleed. And those are always the nurses, it's hard for them sometimes to even explain why they feel that way. But those are the ones you wanna pick their brain, like, well, what, what made you think that? Why are you thinking that? What are the signs? So do you think that a nurse of 20 years is an expert? Has to be an expert if you've been doing it for 20 years. Can a nurse of 10 years be an expert? So I see Brian's message. I've known many that are not. So I've known many nurses who have been nurses longer than I've been alive, who are not experts in their practice. So to be an expert in your field, in your practice, what methods can you think that can help you move along that trajectory faster from novice to expert? So you need to keep up with education and technology. You never, need, you never stop learning need to practice. And really the big takeaway that I want you guys to think about is that you have to do some reflective practice and journaling. So when something happens to you and you write about it, it's like you've experienced that same situation twice. So instead of you needing to experience that situation with two patients, when you write about it and think about what you could have done better, you've already experienced it twice, moving you forward in that trajectory to become an expert. When you take your first job and you are orienting, every single day that you work with your preceptor, you need to sit down and say, okay, I noticed you did this. Why did you do this? You know, like, even if it's something small, like, why did you move the bedside table from here to there? And they may say, oh, 
I noticed that he's right-handed. So because he's going to probably try to get out of bed on the right side, I moved everything to that side to sort of keep him from trying to get out of bed on that side so he doesn't fall. So, you know, you want to really pick the brains of your preceptor and every single day should be a day where you reflect on your practice and say, okay, what did I do that was good today? What can I improve on so that the next time you come in, you can improve upon it? Because, and I always try to do this with my clinical groups as well, is if we have a code, if we have any situations that happen, I always go to the nurse and say, okay, do you mind, you know, just talking to me about how did you know this patient was going to code? Did you have any feelings that they were going to code? Because sometimes the little things that they notice are things that I can take back to the students and we can talk about, all right, so if you have a patient with a GI bleed, these are the little things you should be looking for. These are the things you need to have in your room. And instead of you having to have five GI bleeds before you understand what needs to be done, you may only need to have one and already or none, but learn from someone else's um, methodology. So those are all things that when I orient and precept new grads are tools that I give to them to really engage in reflective practice. Because yeah, you could be a nurse of 30 years, but if you're just coming in, doing the same thing, not really thinking, not really expanding or reflecting on your practice, you're not going to grow. You know, like my first year, I had a notebook where I took all my reports and also I would write all my questions and I would kind of journal out like, okay, did I do good today? You know, what could I have done better? I called the doctor and I didn't have all my facts and he was upset. So next time I call the doctor, I'm going to make sure I always know my vitals. I always know my urine output just to make things go fast. You know, so you learn from your own little mistakes and that all helps you move forward. So professional development, there are multiple factors that have influenced nursing. One of the big ones is just how we were founded. Um, we were founded during wars. And at that time, women were not allowed to touch men in situations other than a nurse. And so really the head nurses or the nightingale nurses wanted to make sure you were tough, wanted to make sure you could handle the gore, wanted to make sure you were smart enough. And that mentality almost still persists to this day because you know, sometimes someone won't trust you until they see that you've done something great and then all of a sudden they think you're super smart, which is totally, I find ridiculous. But, you know, we're moving away from that. And so, you know, a quick overview of the Nurse Practice Act, you know, really just take a quick look at it. It just gives you a big overview of our standards of practice. And the American Nurses Association also has a standards of practice. And it talks about accountability of nurses in the United States. So there are a lot of things people think they're going to lose their license over. But really, the big things that you could lose your license over is um, prescribing, which could be something as simple as you go in to bring the patient 10 milligrams of oxycodone for a pain level of seven. And the patient says, you know what, I only want one. And you give one, but you never go back and, you know, readjust or get a one-time order for that five milligrams because that five milligrams should not have been given. It's the patient's right to adjust, but you also then need to go follow up and get a one-time order or have the physician adjust the scale because now the patient probably has less pain. You could lose your license if you abandon your patient. Um, you could lose your license if you falsify a medical record. And so those are like the big key things. 
And so when you look at the chain of command, you've got the staff nurse. Sometimes in between here, you also have a charge nurse and an assistant nurse manager. You have your nurse manager. And in between here, you may have a associate chief nursing officer. And then you have at the very top, the chief nurse executive, which is you know, ultimately the person responsible for all of nursing in that facility. And so you always wanna use your chain of command. You wanna go up your chain of command if you have issues. So for this page here, it's just important to understand what each of these roles of the nurse represent and what they mean. So we talked about being a patient advocate. What does it mean to be a change agent? When you think of change agent, what does that say to you? So help with change, make a change, make a suggestion, help the patient get better, point out issues that need to be changed and addressed. So, you know, one thing that, you know, when I was an educator, nurses, the unit that we moved to was very large and very spread out. And they found it to be time consuming to walk to the clean utility room to grab supplies to put an IV in. So what did the nurses do? They created little IV bags. So each room had three IV insertion kits in it. And so then the nurse wouldn't have to run out and grab all that equipment. It was already put together in a little bag. What does it mean to be a leader? So being a team player, taking charge, setting an example, taking an initi initiative, advocating, leading by example. So remember, as a nurse at the bedside, you are a leader. You are the one that knows everything that's going on. You are the one that should be coordinating and collaborating with all of the different teams to make sure that things happen and definitely take that responsibility on and you know, if the doctor's like, oh, I wanna come in and put a central line in, but you also need to get your patient to x-ray, that's collaborate. What is more important, getting the patient to x-ray or putting the line in? And then you can give your input and we can talk about it as a team. So for this page, I really want you guys to focus and review the definitions of what the roles and functions are of a professional nurse so that you can then apply them to a situation. And so this is just the quality and safety education for nurses. This is the education that the state expects that you understand by the time you leave nursing school. And so if you look at your evaluation form, this is how we evaluate you here at Labore. You are here in the middle. We want to evaluate that you're providing patient-centered care, that you understand how informatics impacts your learning and your patient, evidence-based practice, making sure that we're not just doing things because we say so, but that we have evidence that leads us, being professionals, making sure you show up 15 minutes early, have your uniform on, your badge displayed and ready to you know, hit the day, that you know and follow quality and safety protocols. If you notice that someone has a Foley catheter in, you wanna think about quality improvement. Should they still have this catheter in? Because we don't want them to get an infection. And safety, if a patient is at risk for falls, what are we gonna do to make sure that patient doesn't fall? And then teamwork and collaboration. So I would go back and review collaboration in your Pearson book and um, just review a kind of skim 
a little bit about what collaboration and teamwork is, because as the nurse, one of the things we evaluate you guys on is how do you guys collaborate with the interdisciplinary team in the clinical setting? Are you guys paging doctors? Are you guys talking to the social worker? Are you guys talking to nutritionists? You know, when I do clinical, I pretty much say, you are the nurse today. You are the one doing all the paging, doing all the documentation, doing everything. And in about 16 weeks, you will be out of this and you will be the nurse. So key points, definition of what uh, professionalism, which was on the front page, characteristics and traits of a professional nurse. It's in your Pearson textbook, talks about things such as coming to work on time, coming to work prepared and dressed appropriately, use an appropriate language in the workplace environment. We talked about the types of commitment to the profession. You wanna memorize those, you wanna know how to apply them. If you're given a scenario and you're told that the nurse is now only working because they have their mortgage to pay, what commitment, what stage of commitment is this nurse in? You know, those are the type of things you want to think about. Definitely understand Benner's stages. Knowing that competence takes two to three years to achieve. Continuance. Thank you, Soraya. Standards of nursing practice. Basically, just have a general idea and what the purpose is. Why do we have standards of nursing practice? You know, they're there to keep us all within our, you know, field of practice. We don't want to, we didn't agree to practice medicine. We didn't agree to practice physical therapy. We agree to practice nursing. And so we should know what our standards are and why. Know the chain of command and how you would respond to a situation following that chain of command. And then understand all those roles and functions of a nurse. So I would go in to your, one of the ways to study for this is take all those roles and just write a definition of how you foresee a nurse acting as a case manager, acting as a leader, acting as a teacher. You know, what, you know, scenarios can you think of that they would be behaving in that way? Any questions? All right, so we will have a review on the 29th of January, most likely at 6 p.m. And so as you guys are studying and thinking, you know, write your questions off to the side if something comes up and you don't understand. If you need an immediate response because you feel it's holding you from studying the next thing, definitely you can email me on, on this um, content and ask questions, but you know, if it's something you can wait on, you can come to um, our review with questions. And we'll also try to put together some questions just so that um, if no one has questions, we have questions for you. So I hope you guys enjoy the evening and have a restful evening. And I look forward to seeing you guys. I won't see you guys for a couple of weeks, but I will be here if you guys need anything.